when will PayPal stock start roaring again? After a remarkable run last year with a stock up nearly 90%, the online payments kingpin, well, has been mostly marking time in 2018. I think it's taking a breather before its next leg higher, but don't take it from me. Earlier today, I got a chance to check in with John Rainey, the chief financial officer of PayPal Holdings. Take a look. John, you've got a really big analyst day next week. And I'd like to know, what are some of the themes you're going to go over? Yeah, well, a couple. Um, one is, after our last quarter call, there was a, a bit of noise in the market around our relationship with eBay. And so we're hoping to be able to address that, to allay any concerns that uh, investors and analysts have about that and our ability to, to weather that transition. We're also blessed with a pretty good balance sheet. And so we'll talk a little bit more about uh, capital allocation. And then lastly, what our plans are to continue to grow at the rate that we've done over the past couple of years. As a CFO, you understand capital allocation. Uh, I'd like to get a sense of, with a $5 billion buyback, whether you actually put that money to work and whether, given the fact that the cash flow is extraordinary for PayPal, not talked about enough, there is an opportunity to do some acquisitions and buy back even more stock. Yeah, well, all of the above. And so when we look at our cash generation, <clears throat> start there. We're, we're generating free cash flow margins that are 20 to 25 percent, and we've been doing that sustainably. We've got uh, the sale of our U.S. consumer credit receivables that occurring in July, and that's going to give us six billion dollars more of cash. And we've already got a, a strong balance sheet as it is. And so, with with that backdrop, we believe that not only can we return cash to shareholders, but we can continue to acquire companies for growth as well. And there's a lot of opportunities to go out there and and target companies that are complementary to our platform. And so. You you should expect to see us be more active in both those. Now, we all know about the separation. Uh, you mentioned the noise with eBay. And I think that there's a presumption that you guys are enemies, uh, that there will be bad will, and that, frankly, neither one wants to do well. I'm getting the opposite view when I speak to people in your organization. And I also suggest, and like to suggest to you that there have to be a lot of opportunities that you can't take advantage of because of the current agreement. Uh, that's exactly correct. So let me start with the fact that we have a very good relationship with eBay. They're our largest customer today. They still represent about 13% of our overall volume. But as we look at transitioning to the next chapter after the existing operating agreement ends, we feel very good about that. This was always contemplated in our plans. And I'll give you a couple data figures to, to put this in context. So if you look at the average revenue growth of the 87% of our business since our separation from eBay, it's grown at 23% on average each quarter, 23%. The eBay part of our business has grown at 4%. If you fast forward those to 2020, 21, you can see that eBay will be a much, much smaller part of our overall business. But very importantly, we've announced an agreement with eBay where we will extend the branded uh, payment button. And that's the largest and most profitable part of our business. But to your point, the, the next chapter allows us to go partner with other marketplaces in a way that we haven't been able to before. It's possible that those additional new partnerships could be greater earnings per share than what you might drop off with with eBay. It's absolutely possible. So just if you look at our top 10 marketplaces other than eBay today, that represents tens of billions of dollars of payment volume for us. They're growing at a rate in excess of 50% on average. And so we're very excited about the opportunities that are out there. Why do you think that so many people feel that Amazon must win if they come into your uh, category? Because even though Amazon is unique in terms of how powerful it is, it's powerful because it destroys retailers. Why would a retailer want to partner with them, giving them their valuable information versus PayPal? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. If you look at, we just I, I think we should acknowledge the fact that probably every boardroom in America is talking about Amazon and the impact on their business. And, and certainly if you are losing your business to Amazon, it's curious why you would want to let them come in and process your payments and have access to that important information. So what we want to do is continue to power commerce for the other 19 million merchants that we have around the world. Fair enough. Venmo. Uh, this morning an analyst comes out from Nomura and says Venmo needs to be careful because Square Cash is uh, basically growing faster than you. Uh, another story that people want you to play defense on. What do you think? Well, we're exceptionally excited about Venmo and how it's tracking right now. Venmo is very different than a lot of other apps, whether it's Zelle or Square Cash or, or, or others that are out there, in that it contains a social feed. And that's very important to this millennial demographic that's using that. They place a value on experiences. And so something like 90% 
of all transactions on Vidmo have incorporated the social feed where people are sharing their experience with one another. And that's very important to merchants as well because it's effectively word of mouth advertising. Um, including emojis. Including emojis, yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you bring up the idea of millennials, younger people. Uh, you have an ethos, and the ethos is to help the unbanked wherever they are. There are a lot of people around the world who are unbanked. One, how big is that market? And two, how come millennials seem to know that you are the banker for the unbanked? Yeah, so you're exactly right. We, we have a vision of democratizing financial services that, for those that are underserved today. And so there's something like 2 billion people across the world that don't have things that you and I take for granted, a checking account a banking account, a home mortgage, traditional financial services. The unique aspect about those two billion people is that 70% of them have a mobile device. And so with a mobile device, we can put all of the power of a bank, bank branch in the palm of their hand and allow them to, to join the world of e-commerce and shop online. How do you get to those people to let them know about PayPal? Well, one thing we did last year was we launched Domestic India. That's something that we're extremely excited about. I think if you're going to be a, a global payments player, you've got to have a footprint in India. It's a market of 1.2 billion people. There's something like 400 million mobile phones in that market. And so we're very excited about the launch I know Walmart would agree with you after the gigantic acquisition of yes. Indeed. Let me just ask it, not a lightning round, so to speak, but I know you watch the show, but uh, gambling in PayPal. Yep. Possible? Um, so we actually allow that for certain merchants today where it's legalized and, the, and, and, and uh, consumers can do it legally as well. And so we're watching this closely, and if that's what uh, our merchants and consumers want to do and they can do it in a legal way, we'll support it. I know Square's made a big fuss about the idea that they do crypto, but how about this? How about if you could translate crypto immediately into dollars? Wouldn't you want to be at that cash register so that there's no, uh, let's just say, uh, opportunity to have PayPal on the hook? Well, so that's actually the issue that we see with crypto. So with our Braintree part of our platform, we actually were one of the first companies to allow merchants to accept uh, uh, cryptocurrencies years ago. But what we saw is that because of the volatility of the cryptocurrencies, right. if you're a merchant and you have, let's say, a 10% margin on a product that you sell and you accept Bitcoin, for example, and the very next day it moves 15%, you're now underwater on that transaction. So what happens, or what was happening, is they were immediately moving that to a more stable currency. So right now, we don't see a lot of interest from our merchants, but if it's something that stabilizes in the future and is a, more, uh, is a better currency, then we'll certainly support that. All right, John, one last question. Why do you think, uh, I know I have my reasons, but why do you think that PayPal's had to play defense ever since you got here, even though the stock's been remarkable before? Yeah. Well, I think it's a couple things. One is that we're misunderstood as a company. We compete in a lot of different areas, right? And so we, not only do we have a branded payment button, but as I suggested, we do unbranded process and we do international money remittances. And so there's competition coming from every area. And what I don't think is, is commonly understood is the competitive moat that exists with a strong two-sided network. And so we have over 220 million consumers on one side of the network, 19 million merchants on the other. And you can have something that appeals to consumers, but if merchants don't accept it, it's of little value. And the reverse is true as well. And importantly for us, we control that experience with technology end to end. Well, I look forward to the May 24th uh, analyst meeting. Thank you so much, John Ramsey, Thank you, Jim. PayPal CFO. Good to talk to you. Appreciate it. Booyah! Jim Cramer here from Mad Money. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube. Click here to subscribe and get the jump on my exclusives with CEOs, plus market news, investing advice, and a whole lot more.